Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the latest in our series of Eno Center for Transportation uh, webinars. As you know, Eno is an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank, and we are currently celebrating our 100th year as an organization. Check it out at 100years.enotrans.org for discussion forums, our Living Legacy podcast series, and other interactive elements as we reflect on the last 100 years and look forward to the next. My name is Paul Lewis. I'm the Vice President of Policy here at Eno. Um, and today we're discussing the Los Angeles Metro's bus, Flower Street bus lanes. Um, we all know that dedicated lanes can make bus travel more reliable, can make it more responsive, can, make, can, can reduce crowding. Um, and as agencies across the country are considering building and expanding their bus lane network, uh, lessons from the Los Angeles' Flower Street pilot provides important insights for agencies and planners. Um, in this webinar, we're gonna specifically look at our newest publication, which uh, is available for download on our website, A Budding Model, Los Angeles' Flower Street Bus Lanes, and examine how this bus lane, which was deployed as a tactical pilot, uh, gained widespread approval and greatly improved mobility in a heavily trafficked corridor by maximizing the use of existing street space. And to do so, we've brought together some experts uh, from LA Metro to explore the Flower Street bus lane pilot um, in LA. Um, we have Cassie Halls, who is the senior transportation planner at LA Metro. We have Ida Safai, who is, a, who is the director of construction relations and mitigation programs at LA Metro. And we have Stephen Tu, the director of service planning at LA Metro. And the, the format for today's webinar is a presentation of the paper. So I'm gonna turn it over here to Cassie Halls in just a moment. She's gonna talk through the, um, the, the paper, some of the findings, how this pilot went together, and then what were some of the outcomes. And then after that presentation, we're gonna have a panel discussion with uh, where I'm gonna moderate a discussion between Cassie and Ida and Steven, where we talk through some of the questions that I have and hopefully some of the questions that you have. Um, if you have a question, of course, you can enter it uh, in the box on the right side of your screen uh, at any time, and we will get to as many questions as possible during the Q&A. Um, we don't ex expect any tech issues, but for individ individual listeners um, experiencing some issues, we found that exiting and rejoining the webinar tends to resolve those uh, pretty quickly. Um, and of course, Eno is happy to offer this webinar series free of charge. If you enjoy our webinars and are interested in supporting Eno's work, check out the link in the chat box to donate or become a member. Um, a recording will also be emailed to all registrants within a day, and we will be posting the slide deck on our website following the webinar. So um, we, uh, check that out. Um, so without further ado, let me turn it over to Cassie, who's gonna talk through um, just a few minutes of the, uh, uh, the paper and some of the findings um, before we have a discussion. Cassie, take it away. Great, thanks, Paul. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, uh, so hello, everyone. I'm excited to share an overview of our research on the Flower Street bus lane. I conducted this work with Joshua Shank and Emma Huang in the Office of Extraordinary Innovation. And I'm also happy that I'm joined by Ida and Steven as they were the ones that actually made this bus lane a reality. Um, so I'll be talking today about some of the unique institutional arrangements, the innovative communications and marketing efforts, and the comprehensive enforcement strategy um, that went into making this tactical bus lane, which was launched in 2019, a resounding success. And it also paved the way to a replicable model that Metro, along with our partners at the Los Angeles Department of Transportation and Streets LA, which is the, the city of LA's Department of Street Services, have used to roll out additional bus lanes, both in 2020 and in 2021. Next slide, please. So a quick intro to the Flower Street bus lane. Um, this is in downtown Los Angeles. It's a one-way southbound street. Um, it's a key bus corridor for a lot of um, metro as well as other municipal bus routes. Um, and also it's a mixed-use, what we're calling mixed-use bus lane, um, which I know other people call it different things, shared-use bus lane, for example. But essentially it's a right-hand curb lane 
um, where there's no physical separation, there's just striping and signage, and um, it's a it's within a peak hour no parking lane. Um, so on the street, there's and actually a lot of streets in in congested parts of Los Angeles, there's a peak hour no parking um, restriction on the right hand curb lane um, that is from three to seven uh, four to seven p.m. and we actually extended it slightly from three to seven. Um, and in addition to that, um, it allows for the use of right turning vehicles um, and bicyclists, as well as emergency vehicles and police. Um, and so it's about, you know, less than two miles in length, um, but it's had some pretty big impacts. Um, and then lastly, I just wanted to note, since I'll be referencing it throughout this presentation, um, that there's also a northbound street that has a bus lane as well. Um, that's kind of the complement to Flower Street. A lot of the buses use both the northbound and the southbound street. Um, and this bus lane is um, a similar, somewhat similar to Flower Street. Um, it's about five um, lane miles. And um, the difference is that it was um, a much larger project. There's more physical separation. Um, and it was a 10 year process to get that lane in place. So Flower Street, had a very different, um, you know, uh, much different process coming about that I'll be talking about. And um, uh, you can go to the next slide. Okay, so um, Flower Street bus lane, we spent about $75,000 on temporary striping and signage. Um, this was a partnership, as I mentioned, with Los Angeles DOT um, to improve the fre frequency, speed, and reliability of bus service. It was a part of a larger um, state of good repair project called the New Blue. Um, and this was a traffic mitigation effort um, to help with two stations that were closed um, and bus bridges ran on both Flower and Figueroa Street. Um, and there was this was already a pretty heavily used corridor. There were around 50 buses per hour prior to um, the, the pilot, but it increased up to 80 buses an hour because there were all of these shuttles that were running these bus bridges between the rail stations. Um, so I'll, the program was called the New Blue, but um, we actually recently went through a name change with all of our rail lines. So I'll reference it as the A line and the E line. So the A line used to be called the Blue Line and the E line is the Expo line. And both of those, um, those two stations uh, were closed down on both of those lines. Next slide, please. Um, one other note I'll just make um, is that what we did was we enforced both Flower Street and Figueroa Street at the same time, and we enforced both the AM and the PM peak because uh, Flowers, uh, Figueroa Street was a 24-hour bus lane. Um, but in terms of the larger context within LA County, um, there are currently 107 total lane miles of, of bus lanes. Uh, most of them are in the city of Los Angeles in downtown. There's also a few in Santa Monica, as you can see on the map. Um, and uh, these are a mix of the mixed use bus lanes, um, as well as, uh, you know, dedicated busways that run, for example, the J line, which runs from El Monte to uh, downtown to San Pedro, um, that's on the, the freeways, and then also the orange line, which is the G or orange line, which is a dedicated um, busway. So it's a mix of uh, BRT and then more of these tactical lanes that we've been putting in over the last few years. Next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of downtown, um, Flower Street, as I mentioned, runs um, parallel to Figueroa Street. Uh, those are two of the downtown bus lanes, but there's also a few more that are denoted here on the map. And a lot of them um, exist um, primarily to kind of provide for high congestion pinch points in downtown. Um, there's also the J line, which you can see here, um, runs through downtown uh, and Flower and Figueroa Streets serve the J line. Next slide, please. Okay, so just a few notes about the way we did this um, study. We looked at three different periods in the pilot um, in order to, to do some interesting comparisons and to make sure that our results were valid. Uh, so we looked at a control, which was before the bus lane went in, and there were up to 53 buses an hour. Um, no bu bus bridges were running because the project had not yet started. And then we looked at another period between June and August of 2019, 
um, which was the mid pilot period that we are calling it. Um, and the bus lane was operational on Flower Street and Figueroa, and it was being enforced by um, our uh, LAPD, so the Los Angeles Police Department and Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. Um, and during this time period, both the E-Line um, and A-Line shuttles were running, um, which meant that there were up to 80 buses an hour running on Flower Street and Figueroa. And then from September to November, we also looked at this period of time when um, one of the lines had reopened, but the other line was um, still closed, so shuttles were running. Um, and what we saw was that there were you know, more like 70 buses an hour running. Um, and this was actually a more manageable level in terms of the number of buses per hour in the quarter. Next slide, please. Um, so what did the bus lane accomplish? Um, it accomplished a lot, it improved travel times. Um, we saw about um, two minutes saved per customer. Um, and this, this roughly equates to about a 30% improvement in travel time. Next slide, please. An even bigger effect was the, um, the improvement in reliability of the service. So what we saw was there are some of these congestion hotspots along the Flower Street bus lane. So the blue line and the orange line that you see here, um, not the blue and orange <laughs> rail lines, but the on the graph, if you look at those two lines, you can see that um, those have you know, much higher uh, travel times in those segments um, than the other segments and that's because these are congestion hotspots. So once we added in the bus lane, if you look at the mid pilot and post pilot period, you can see that the travel time variability went down a lot, um, which ultimately translates to people just feeling like they can rely on the bus being consistent. If you can go to the next slide. Um, so what we heard from customers, um, nearly three fourths of them said that that there were time savings of at least five minutes based on their perception. Um, and more than three fourths of customers also reported that the bus lane improved the reliability of the service. Um, operator feedback was very similar. And what this means um, just in terms of the customer journey is that if you're, you know, I actually rode this line every day to work. So um, I experienced this myself, but um, if you, you know, the bus is more reliable, maybe you don't need to include as much of a buffer time in your commute. Um, so it made a big difference for people. And if you look at it in terms of um, numbers of hours saved, um, it came out to about um, 400, let's see what I have here, 300 hours um, a day saved by commuters, and that's just within the evening peak period. Uh, next slide. Okay, so as I mentioned before, we also had enforcement on the Flower Street bus lane. So we primarily relied on um, uh, boots on the ground. So we had both motorcyclists, um, uh, SUV, and then um, standing um, people, police officers along the bus lane. And this was all funded through the New Blue impro uh, Improvement Project. Um, so it was bundled into those, those costs. But ultimately, the motorcyclists um, and the uh, other police um, would patrol the lane. What they did was um, they largely just kind of circled between um, Figueroa Street and Flower Street continuously um, in order to keep uh, vehicles out of the lane and, and keep the lane moving. So they followed what um, they called kind of a, a proactive enforcement model. So instead of um, you know, stopping um, anyone. They tried to just prioritize mobility in the corridor and they didn't practice zero enforcement. They just said, um, we're going to primarily rely on warnings and then also what they call force ejection. So getting people out of the lane with a horn. Um, and you can see that in this uh, chart that most of the enforcement events were related to warnings, both verbal or written. Um, there were very few parking citations in relation to the moving violations, um, and they're mostly just trying to get people out of the bus lane. Next slide, please. Um, one last point just on enforcement, since I missed it, um, is that enforcement was pretty effective for the bus lane in keeping the, the speeds going and keeping people out of the lane, but it was very expensive. Um, so we spent about $4,000 per lane mile per day which translated to about um, $26,000 a day and $750,000 a month to do enforcement. 
Um, if you think about the total cost of the bus lane, which was about $75,000 for striping and signage, um, you're spending most of your money maintaining and you know, enforcing, ensuring compliance on the bus lane. So that's just something you consider with these tactical bus lanes. We really want them to be effective. Um, it's important to consider what the costs are to enforce them or to pass legislation so you can use camera enforcement or other means of, um, of doing that. So in terms of the, the performance of um, the bus lane, in terms of the mobility in the corridor, this is where we saw some of the most drastic improvements. Um, so what we looked at was, um, we were trying to understand both in terms of vehicle traffic, um, the you know single occupancy vehicle traffic, and the bus, um, how much um, it it transformed the ability for people to get through the corridor. So we saw 80% of the travel in the corridor during the peak hour period, which um, was as I mentioned at the beginning, 3 to 7 p.m., was in the bus lane, um, which is you know a huge portion, um, especially considering that there are two general use lanes. Um, it's a huge portion of all of the travel. Um, and a daily average of around 10,000 bus customers use the bus lane during the evening peak period. Um, and throughput increased by almost 40% compared to pre-traffic conditions. Um, so this roughly translated to about 800 more people that were able to get to the corridor um, with the same number of vehicles. Next slide, please. Okay, so I think it's important to um, caveat some of the benefits that we, we saw with um, what we see as some of the challenges with mixed use bus lanes. Um, so I'll go through some of the pros and cons that at least we documented within the, um, the case study and these are continuing to evolve, but some of the pros are that it's great for peak hour traffic um, and space constraint, constraint environments where not much else can be um, put in. So often you don't have space for a dedicated busway. And so this is a great way to get the outcomes that you want um, while making making kind of the most use of space. Um, in addition, using the peak hour parking restrictions in the right hand curb lane was a great way to ease people into the idea of a bus lane, you know, didn't have a huge impact on parking, um, actually didn't affect parking at all. Um, so this was a great thing, especially in Los Angeles. Um, and then lastly, it, it shortens and encourages a more iterative planning process. Um, so for one, it allows us to roll out bus lanes much quicker and more responsive to things like the need for traffic mitigation during a rail station closure. Um, and it also allowed us to um, have the riding public weigh in in a more equitable way during the process. So we did rider and operator surveys throughout the pilot. And that allowed us to bring those findings to the board our board of directors and show that you know people were behind the bus lane. We weren't just hearing from um, you know NIMBYs or different groups of people. We really were hearing from the people that are directly benefited. Next slide, please. Oh, actually, sorry, I'm going to talk about the cons. Um, so some of the cons of a mixed use peak hour bus lane is that there's less physical separation. Um, so the bus, um, as I mentioned, you need more enforcement in the bus lane. So even though the costs are lower at the beginning in terms of the design, um, the costs are really being moved into the enforcement and maintenance of the lane. So um, I think I mentioned at the beginning that Figueroa Street um, is a, you know, the, the northbound version of this bus lane. That one was, you know, 10 years in the making and cost $20 million. So it's a big difference. But if you think about the cost of enforcement over time, it does add up um, unless you come up with a more creative um, and, you know, maybe more, um, just way of enforcing the lane. Um, so that's something just to consider as you start on these types of projects. Um, and then peak hour lanes can also be confusing for motorists. You can get some unintended non-compliance where you have people that maybe don't understand that the bus lane is, um, uh, because it's only peak hour, they are used to driving in at other times and they don't realize that they can't drive in it. So that is a problem. Um, we see this across time-based restrictions in, um, you know, across engineering. Um, and so this is a problem that um, you should account for. And if you can do a 24 hour bus lane, you should. Um, and then lastly, uh, less time savings um, were recorded in this than you would see from like a separated bus lane or a busway. Next slide, please. Okay, so this slide really just shows why it matters. Um, so in at LA Metro, our riders are largely persons of color. 
they're living under the poverty line and they're extremely reliant on the bus. They're taking it, um, you know, the majority are taking it four times a day or more. And there's a huge socioeconomic and equity benefit of an investment such as this. So in terms of thinking about how to directly benefit our customers um, quickly and uh, effectively, bus lanes like this are, are a great way to do that. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so just a few quick takeaways um, as we launch into the Q&A. Um, short mixed use bus lanes are a great way to improve travel time reliability and heavy, heavily traffic corridors. Um, you see the biggest um, effect when you think about it on the people level or the corridor level in terms of the improvements. Um, and also there was a low infrastructure cost, which was great, um, but that should be weighed with the enforcement costs that are needed to maintain the lane. And then lastly, um, the unique engagement strategy that Ida will be talking about more um, allowed community-based organizations to um, use uh, the Flower Street bus lane as a platform for advocacy. So for example, a group called Investing in Place in LA um, really were excited and saw hope and change um, in the Flower Street bus lane. Um, and it was a kind of a launching pad for a lot of their advocacy work. So that's exciting to see. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cassie, for that. And I'm going to welcome the, the uh, panel to join me here. Um, again, we have Cassie Halls, uh, Senior Transportation Planner at LA Metro. We also have Stephen Tu, the Director of Service Planning at LA Metro, and Ida Safai, the Director of Construction Relations and Mitigation Programs at LA Metro. So great panels. Um, really excited for the conversation and want to jump into a couple things. And I actually first have there um, for folks on the, on the live webinar again. There is a, a question box on your go-to webinar control panel. Um, please go ahead and, and type in some questions. We already have a bunch coming in. Um, and my first one is for Cassie. We have just a, a couple clarification things. Um, uh, specifically, actually, a few folks are, are interested in your discussion about uh, travel time variance. Um, you had a slide where we talked about travel time variance, and um, can you just give a little bit of context into, um, is that comparing the median or average travel time or some other percentile, um, and, and just talk about a little bit more too and expand on um, how, how we measure reliability and how we communicate reliability to perhaps some non-technical staff or other stakeholders um, that might not to, to fully understand how the numbers and, and what they what they mean. I might ask Stephen to assist, but I'll give a short overview, which is we looked at the average travel time, and then we looked at um, the variance in travel times in those individual segments. Um, so one thing I didn't mention is that um, we use the Wi-Fi data on buses um, in order to get every, essentially every 10 seconds, the Wi-Fi gives a geolocation. Um, and so we used a small sample, um, or we used a small sample of buses, but a large number of these, what we call pings, um, in order to determine where the bus was at different points in those three study periods. And then we looked at the average um, travel time within the, the Flower Street corridor. And then we looked at the variance in travel time. Um, and we also looked at kind of the standard deviation as well. But um, I don't know if that, that's enough clarification. And also, Stephen, if you want to add anything in. Sure. I mean, I, I guess just uh, I think you covered the first part well. And, and as far as the second question about how can we relate this to uh, the, the non-data scientists, and I, I think in, in that sense, we, um, we really see that the improvement uh, as we get stay closer to the standard deviation, we um, have more reliable arrivals. That also means more re uh, more reliable uh, crowding levels or utilization on board the bus. Um, when you have those big swings and in, in delays, uh, that can exacerbate the, uh, down the line that the next buses that arrive. And so this actually allows us to provide um, not only a, a more on-time trip uh, for, for the most amount of people, but it also optimizes our capacity. And I think the other important piece is that uh, while two minutes sounds really small, um, when we look at it, we're only looking at a very short corridor that we were uh, that we were doing this bustling, but a very important one. And you saw that the the um, perception was that people saved over five minutes, even though the actual time save was two minutes. So the perception is real, 
And it, it also is real in the sense that two out of three, I believe about two out of three of our boardings um, or have some sort of transfer involved. And so everyone knows when you're transferring from a bus to bus or rail to bus, that two minute savings could be the difference between whether you make that transfer or you have to wait for the next connection. Got it. Great. Um, and and I've got a, a bunch of questions about um, the impetus for these and, and some of the enforcement and, and other takeaways. But one one just to just to clarify, and I think Cassie went through uh, did a really good job, kind of under talking about how these bus lanes work. They're they're in a mixed right away, but they have their own dedicated lane that is um, only during peak hour and and uh, it's parking and, and other times. Um, perhaps just to clarify the the definition that we're talking about in terms of mixed use, um, that that word came up, um, and and I'll I'll kick that one to you, uh, Cassie, just again to talk about um, some of the some of those details and and just remind folks about what it is we're talking about, and then see if if Stephen and Ida have anything to add. Yeah, I think you summarized it well. But essentially, bikes were allowed in the bus lane, um, right turning vehicles. Um, and then uh, emergency vehicles and police officers were allowed to use the bus lane. But it was a um, right-hand um, curbside lane that during the day is used for parking. Um, this is a street that um, is pretty empty during the day and then completely um, congested during the evening peak because it's kind of an exit from downtown. Um, and so it was a really creative use of that space um, given that this was a the people are mostly parking during the day and then during the evening they're trying to use the the lane so um, it was maximizing that parking space for a bus lane um, and yeah it was from 3 to 7 p.m that the bus lane ran um, and originally the peak hour parking restriction was from 4 to 7. Um, so we just extended it by one hour and got a huge benefit out of it. Got it. There. Thanks for that. Um, all right, so I want to take a little bit of a step back, and we have a couple questions again about why. Why did why did we do this project in the first place? And and perhaps this is a good question for Ida. Um, can you talk about how um, this construction mitigation, right? Because this this came about because we, we were shutting down some light rail lines. Um, how did this come about, and and what what was the the original intent here for this bus lane? Yeah, absolutely. Hi everyone. Um, so really, the, taking a step back, the, the big picture um, view of this is that this was a mitigation for a huge closure um, that we had. Metro um, did an investment of $350 million in our oldest light rail line, which is the formerly the blue line and now the A line. And um, we had to uh, suspend service, rail service, um, along that line uh, in eight months. And we did it in two um, phases. So first half, uh, we had to suspend service on the southern end, and then the second half was the northern end. And so while we did this, as you can imagine, um, we provided uh, uh, complimentary uh, bus shuttles. Uh, we actually had four different types of bus shuttles. Most of them were complimentary. One of them was an express bus. And so we wanted to provide options uh, for our riders because this is one of the heaviest uh, and the busiest um, uh, rail lines that we have here in Los Angeles. And due to the bus shuttles that we had, we had four, as I mentioned, um, and there was you know, there's tons of buses running on Flower Street, regardless of our, our work. Because of the increased um, buses on, on Flower Street and in the area, in an already congested area, this was a mitigation um, so that we can improve mobility and bus service reliability. That's really at the core. We really wanted to provide that mitigation for our customers because they're already being impacted by not having that rail service and are taking bus service instead. So this was the mitigation to provide um, better reliability uh, being on our buses. And I'll stop and see if Stephen wants to add anything. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Ida. I, I guess I would just add, I mean, to give some context um, about uh, how heavy uh, the blue line now, uh, Metro A line ridership is. It's it's typically up there about the second busiest light rail line in the entire country, um, second to Boston's green line on the T, uh, those of you on the East Coast. And so um, there's really a lot of people. We had shut the line down in half uh, into two different phases. And so when you think about tens of thousands of riders, uh, we, we really looked at what were the passenger behaviors, we looked at uh, origin destination pairs, 
um, that came allowed us to come up with. And I know Ida sometimes chuckles at this. I, I like ice cream, so I call them flavors of service. And so we had a local, a semi-express, mm -hmm. and, and a, an express service um, that all funneled into really provide different types of service based on where people were going to. And we optimized the service levels um, even by time of day to really match what was the passenger behavior there. And then when you take that on top of all of the other commuter express buses that are coming into and out of downtown LA during the peak hour, we quickly realized that there really is um, no way to reliably provide a, a good level of service with uh, unless we were to put in some sort of tactical transit infrastructure. And so with that, we really couched this as a pop-up bus lane, uh, really using the success that we had seen from Boston and from New York, um, and really reaching out to some of our, our peer uh, cities, uh, those in uh, with uh, multimodal agencies, and uh, really try to understand how could we get something in quickly and as Cassie said, instead of taking 10 years, how could we get something maybe in, in 10 weeks? And, and that's great. And maybe a follow-up for you, Stephen, is, is of course, this is a, um, a construction mitigation tool. Um, so what happened after construction was done? Yeah, it's a really great question. And, and so the, the, the results that we saw after were, were positively surprising. Um, even after we had reopened the rail line completely, we actually saw a lot of commuters stick with the commuter express service as an alternative instead of getting back onto the train once that reopened. And I think that's really a testament to customers wanting a reliable service. Um, and that is something that they were able to see with uh, really high compliance with the different tools uh, that we used. In fact, there is a, um, a sort of a BRT line that we also have. It was in the map that Cassie showed in the presentation, the Metro Silver Line. Uh, it's now called the Metro J Line uh, as we transition towards a, a line letter designation. Uh, but the, that line actually saw a 25% increase in ridership that actually sustained beyond after we reopened the rail line uh, to the point where we are now running the articulated buses. We've converted to higher capacity vehicles even after we upgraded and refurbished the rail line. That's really, we believe, a testament to um, the, the, that this was uh, really left a, left a positive legacy uh, for uh, giving our customers uh, more choices uh, that better fit their needs. So the, the bus line is continuing indefinitely? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so so we had another, uh, there was, uh, as I, I touched on a little bit, we did have the bus shuttles, the temporary bus shuttles that were running during the rail closure. But on top of that, we already had also a, a, a commuter express service, the Metro J line, uh, Silver, that, um, that runs on our express lanes, our hot lanes here in Los Angeles. And uh, that one saw a significant increase that actually sustained uh, even after uh, the, the rail line reopened. Got it. Um, so I'm going to pull back a little bit. Um, a lot of questions about um, how you all got this done and some of the, the political and community barriers, as well as some of the enforcement issues that I want to get into in a minute. But um, maybe maybe a question for both Ida and Stephen, but talk about the um, the support for this. How How did Metro gather support for this bus lane and what was that process like? Yeah, um, I'll start and then uh, pass it on to Stephen. So I think with anything, any initiative really, um, it starts at home, right? So we, we first had to um, have internal support and buy-in. Um, and so making sure that we're aligned um, in various uh, units and departments uh, at Metro, making sure that we're coordinating very closely with the construction project and the contractor. And, you know, they're, they're, this was a huge undertaking that we were doing when we were shutting down the rail service. So we needed to ensure that we have alignment. So that was the first step. Um, and through that internal process, also our board, as well as our elected officials, um, the mayor's office, city council districts, as well as some of the grass stops. Um, so and when we say grass stops, we refer to um, the neighborhood councils, the uh, business, business improvement districts. Um, you know, those are, those are kind of the grass stops that we refer to here at LM Metro. And so making sure to talk to those folks, we already had, as Cassie mentioned, the um, uh, bus lane on Figueroa. So taking a look at what were the lessons learned from that 
you know, implementation of that? How can we um, then also hear about any other concerns before we move to any any other um, stakeholders? So starting internally, moving to elected officials um, and you know, neighborhood associations, community stakeholders, and then we literally did door to door. So we walked, I remember walking in the scorching sun, door to door on Flower Street, talking to businesses, hearing any concerns that they had, whether they were dealers, they were uh, residences, um, schools, hospitals, an area, and then doing a mailing in addition to that door to door, um, and um, also doing email blasts, um, presentations, briefings, and lastly, um, folks who are parking in the area. We, so we want to make sure we also got uh, folks that are going to those businesses. So we also did flyer drops. So this was all part of a multi-pronged approach, um, very educational based, um, you know, wanting to inform and educate and hear any concerns before we moved into implementation. So we worked very closely with Stephen and, and the team. Um, at the, I think it was a really great collaboration. I'll pass yeah. it to you, Stephen. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it, it, it was really great that we we saw um, a lot of lessons learned uh, during uh, and, and pre-implementation and then a lot uh, from post that we have a lot of momentum that I'll touch on in just a moment. But when we went into this, as Ida mentioned, uh, the, the adjacent Figueroa alignment uh, was a, a full complete streets uh, uh, makeover that Figueroa received. And um, it was in the same, the same stakeholders were in the same area for Flower Street. And we received a lot of good feedback and it wasn't all positive um, about what were the impacts to small businesses along Figueroa. We really needed to take that into consideration to gain their support. And one of the, uh, our key board members that actually challenged us in, in, in a uh, briefing that we had, uh, um, you know, talked about here are the great things that we'll do for Metro customers is not so much all the people that are cutting through the area, but what are you going to do for the community itself? And, and, and they are a community that historically gets a lot of cut through traffic, people trying to avoid the freeway to get to the financial district. So what, what can you do to actually make sure that we take care of the community itself? And that really allowed us to go back and say, do we need a 24 seven lane? Or do we need to go during the hours that we are most congested? And we really honed in on the 3 to 7 p.m. hour because as Ida mentioned, there's a nearby vocational college. They have a lot of night classes. And so the, the ability to be able to, to park there is, is really important, particularly if we're going to be um, trying to get this in quickly and, and receive buy-in uh, very quickly. And then long-term, I think what we've seen here is that um, especially when you don't have a, your own right of way, your own property that you own and, and can control the lanes. Um, you really want to be good neighbors in the communities that, that you serve. And so to that end, um, parking is, uh, is very sensitive. And so if we want to get our foot in the door, just like we did with this pop-up bus lane, um, this is really an opportunity where you can ask for what you need and ask for what you need being, when is your frequency, your bus service frequency the highest? Um, at one point we were running 80 buses an hour, that's every 45 seconds a, a bus was going through the corridor. Um, but also when is the traffic congestion actually bad? Because in the middle of the night, if there's no congestion, a bus lane isn't doing anyone any good, uh, it's not doing our service any good, but it's preventing people from parking overnight, particularly in equity focused communities. And so uh, we have a lot of momentum moving forward now um, where our Metro Board of Directors have actually uh, uh, directed us to uh, work more closely with the LA City Department of Transportation because they are the authority of the streets. Uh, Metro, we're, we're generally operating uh, the bus service and rail service to really work together to see where can we expand these types of tactical transit infrastructure upgrades uh, throughout the city of Los Angeles region. Got it. That's as with anything in transportation, it's always about the parking. Um, but, it, but in all seriousness, um, can you just talk just a little bit about more about um, the resistance that, that you did find, right? And, and some of that, I think I did I astutely said that there's, there's resistance both within an organization and, um, and within a community. And I think that that's, that's consistent anywhere. Um, talk about what specific things did this project have to overcome um, and what were some of the strategies that, that, that you all used to overcome it? Yeah, um, so starting off with, 
And so key messages, I mean, I just want to start there because, th as I mentioned, this was a rail uh, service um, interruption. And so making sure that we can even include this part of the, cl of the project in our messaging um, was actually something that I wanted to mention from the, from the last uh, question that was difficult because we are already communicating so many different things. We're communicating and to so many different audiences. So we need to make sure that the key message of why we're doing this was very big picture. And I think that's ultimately how we were able to get support. Um, but going back to uh, your question regarding resistance and, and kind of how do we overcome that, I think that it just had to do a lot with close coordination, communication, um, working with the local city council um, districts in the area and understanding who those community organizations are, who those stakeholders are, you know, um, what are the businesses in the area? What are their hours? Um, how can we make sure that we're not impacting the customers going to those um, businesses because due to parking and you know uh, the curb lane being um, restricted for that additional hour? So I would say the key thing was communication and really just bringing them along one step at a time. So not with a forceful hand, but rather working together um, on this initiative and seeing again, going back to that big picture, why this is important and then working through some of those um, challenges together. And, and and Paul, I think, you know, as you touched on just before on, on our previous question, I think that a lot of the resistance comes down to parking uh, parking impacts, and I think parking impacts, not necessarily the, the, the actual parking impacts, but the perceived uh, parking impacts, and uh, we, we know as transportation planners, uh, you know, the perception versus the reality of a single parking space and how much room that uses, um, but really being able to address that um, with the community is something that is very important, and so um, that is something that why we are really looking at corridors where there exists a no parking time period today during the rush hour and so then we can go back to the community and say well actually today there's already no parking what we're asking for is just a one hour extension of that and we're not taking away your overnight parking or your weekend parking and, and that i think again really helps to get us our foot in the door and i believe that as we expand this this is the perception of and the acceptance the general acceptance of tactical transit infrastructure throughout los angeles it is really going to start to become interwoven with the fabric of los angeles and i think that's really where we'll start to see a paradigm shift in in sort of metro's role and, and public transit's role in the region got it and um, so i want to shift gears um to enforcement but one quick question that came up that i thought was interesting is this did this um did this project use any federal funds and were there any kind of environmental document produced for this project so yeah mm -hmm. I, you, yeah uh, I, I guess I'll just speak really quickly about the uh, yeah in terms of environmental um, fortunately in uh, Los Angeles we have um, uh, there is a settlement agreement that uh, the city of LA's Department of Transportation otherwise here called LA DOT um, has that um, can, we can look at um, historic vehicle counts or recent uh, vehicle counts, and then we can look at basically what is the spillover effect if we were to repurpose a traffic lane, if it does not meet a specific threshold. And I don't have that specific threshold with me right now, but Flower Street did not meet that threshold to, to trigger an additional environmental study. Um, the threshold, um, uh, and so because we were able to avoid um, that threshold, um, we did not, we were able to fast track this without having to do um, a further study. I should also add that the, the way that Flower Street existed before uh, the bus lane was implemented was it was a peak hour lane uh, on the curbside, no parking. And so uh, what LADOT has sort of found in their Vision Zero uh, research is that that lane um, tends to have more aggressive driving and weaving that typically occurs uh, in that lane because it's uh, closer, uh, it's more narrow, the crown of the road, you're a little bit more angled. And so um, generally speaking, it does not actually take carry 
um, a, an equivalent amount or proportionate amount of traffic in that lane. It's actually a lot less. So it was underutilized to begin with because people may not be comfortable. What if there's an illegally parked car there? Then I have anxiety to have to merge back in. And so um, the, the, the actual amount that we were able to, to go back over, the spillover effect is actually less. And I think Cassie's research showed the, the slowing effect in general traffic was about 30 seconds per mile uh, was was the effect, but they have many other parallel streets to use as an alternate to Flower. Got it. Okay. Thanks for that. And so let's switch gears to um, enforcement. There's a bunch of questions about enforcement, uh, wanting some little bit more uh, specifics on how the bus lanes were enforced, how in, how effective was the enforcement, um, and uh, a couple questions too that I like you to talk on in your remarks about um, the. The apparent lack of automated enforcement. A bunch of questions about um, if or why not was was there automated enforcement, and, and so uh, well, maybe we'll turn it over to Ida, and then to Stephen, and then Cassie, if you have anything else to add um, about the enforcement piece and and how it worked. Yeah, um, in terms of enforcement, I'll just start off, um, and I think uh, Stephen has uh, a more comprehensive answer for this, um, but we started um, by educating the community about the pop-up bus lane, and so we did two rounds, well, I talked a little bit already about the community engagement strategy, but in addition to that, um, we also dropped two rounds of flyers, um, spaced about, I believe, maybe 10 days or two weeks apart, to inform um, you know, folks that are parking in, in that lane that this lane will become um, unavailable starting at 3 p.m. instead of 4 p.m. So really um, just, again, I, I can't you know, um, say educational enough. Um, we didn't want to scare anybody off. We didn't you know, have too much of a forceful hand. We wanted to make sure that we're working with the community. Um, you know, there's a lot of students that park in this area. Um, and we just, we wanted to make sure that we're being very fair. So we started with that. And then once the, um, and let them know that by a certain pin, by a certain timeline, we would move to enforcement. And so at that point, I'll um, shift to uh, hand this off to Stephen to talk a little bit more about uh, our work there. Yeah, I, I think we really wanted to take a, uh, not put all our eggs in one basket on one enforcement tool. Um, and, and Ida really talked about the emphasis being on, uh, at, especially at the beginning, education, uh, and rather than being punitive. Uh, and so the, the first few weeks, even before we opened to, um, to even our first couple of weeks after, were all about warnings and education. Um, but really looking at a few different tools. One was LAPD, as uh, Cassie mentioned, um, Los Angeles Police Department. Uh, we have a contract with uh, Metro uh, to police our system, but also draw on them to help us um, uh, to keep these bus lanes clear. Um, that was one tool, and as Cassie mentioned, the motorcycle units are um, really able to kind of get through congestion um, and really be nimble to be able to get into and out, and they're also highly visible. And so, you know, out here, uh, the, way, the way that traffic enforcement works is um, the only ones that can really cite or be able to actually uh, legally move someone is a an, uh, law enforcement, a sworn law enforcement, uh, officer in um, in California, and so they were used as as a means to make sure that the lanes were kept clear. And, and sort of also a traffic control perspective, we also called upon LADOT uh, for their traffic control officers. These are the officers that are able to do uh, parking citations, but also uh, they can go out and direct traffic and in, at intersections, keeping intersections clear. And so we had them there sprinkled at our busiest intersections during the hours of operation here. And so they kept the intersections clear. Um, we had high visibility with LAPD uh, motor enforcement. And then we also had variable message signs that were kicked on during the hours of operation um, that were uh, saying that, you know, there's a new bus lane, a new bus lane there for buses only, um, and it's LAPD enforced. And we, we think that all told, um, this really helped us to um, uh, really get bring about some compliance. And um, I think Cassie can speak a little bit more about the, the automated photo enforcement. It is um, something that we are looking into right now, um, and, and that includes through our legislation. Um, but let me hand it over to Cassie to speak on that. Yeah, and one thing I wanted to add is that we actually designed the bus lanes so that it ran from three to seven. 
in that first hour, we would use um, the LAPD would primarily LAPD, some um, LADOT parking enforcement would clear out the lane and remove any illegally parked vehicles. So it was a way to kind of get the lane clear before congestion arrived. Um, in addition to that, just to the automated enforcement piece, um, as I mentioned, it's extremely expensive to enforce with um, police. And even if you use a mix of these kind of more passive enforcement techniques like the signs and things like that, really the most effective way to get people out of the lane, especially in LA where people uh, will take any you know inch of space, um, drivers will. Um, it was really effective to have the motorcyclists in particular. Um, and so uh, what we're looking forward in the future, we actually, there's this uh, assembly bill, AB 917, um, that Bloom is sponsoring um, that would allow for us to do automated enforcement with cameras on the bus lane if that passes. Um, but we're, we're still, you know, we're kind of trying to come up with a comprehensive enforcement strategy um, that may include, you know, some, um, you know, active enforcement techniques like the police um, and also will include, um, you know, automated techniques. So it's really important to think about kind of the whole ecosystem of, of enforcement and compliance, um, the way you design the lane to encourage people to stay out of it, all the way to, um, you know, the passive techniques that you use like signage, and then lastly, the active enforcement, which is the highest cost, but, you know, often the most effective in terms of um, clearing the lane. Um, I think that that's, Pretty good explanation. Yeah, and, and <laughs> Paul, two more. Happen. Yeah, Paul, two more points. If I just quickly add, I, I think one is that um, you know, when in, in the first week we were having LAPD actually pull them over and cite them or warn them in the bus lane, and so it was actually having a counter uh, uh, effect of blocking the bus lane, and so we were able to quickly work with them, and you know, by Monday or Tuesday, that uh, pull them over to the side, uh, take the next side street, and then pull them over. Um, and educate them there. But, you know, the goal is to keep the bus lane clear. The second piece I just wanted to talk about, especially in, in today's environment of how we can reimagine policing uh, in our system is, um, you know, I think this is a great way to really look at a different role uh, for policing when you consider that we're not just keeping these buses moving uh, faster and more reliable, but consider the people that are on board the bus. And uh, many of them are people of color, many of them are below uh, the poverty line. So we're, we're now using uh, policing as a tool to actually make their commutes faster, uh, make them more reliable rather than policing on board the vehicle. Very good. Okay, so um, I wanna shift gears. We've got about uh, seven or minutes or so left before the top of the hour. Um, and just get a sense from you about how LA Metro has taken the lessons from this pilot and applied it to other things that, uh, that LA Metro are doing. And maybe we'll start with Cassie, since you were one of the report authors, and then we'll go um, after you to Ida and then, and then Stephen, just to get some, some thoughts about you know, what's next and how do, we, how do we take what we've learned and, and use it elsewhere. Yeah, I think um, taking the time to measure the impacts was important um, and to look at kind of the pre and post conditions. It's often maybe you're rushed in trying to get the data and so you don't look at that. So I think that was helpful um, in kind of making the case for future bus lanes like this. Um, and then this also started a process that Stephen and Ida can talk about more where we had a um, technical working group and a, and a community um, relations working group with the city of Los Angeles um, to make sure that we were partnering with them and moving forward and kind of imagining where these different um, bus speed improvements could occur. Yeah, and so on that note, um, in the city of LA, uh, there are a number of heavy corridors, your Wilshire's, Olympics, Venice, Sunset, etc., cetera, um, that, are, um, that have this peak hour uh, curbside lane that is um, street parking during the off peak. And so uh, we're really looking at aligning that with um, our, our next generation of service. We just, Metro just recently completed the next gen bus plan. And so this was really fortunate in that this pop up bus lane really yielded some positive and quick win results um, that we're now looking to apply to our uh, tier one uh, bus corridors. 
many of which fall under these corridors uh, where there are these opportunities to repurpose that peak hour lane. And so to that end, we've actually, since Flower Street, been able to implement an additional eight miles of lane in other parts of uh, the, the area. Um, in the next month or so, we expect to bring that number to about 11, 12 miles of lanes. And next year, um, it, uh, as we continue to work closely with the city of Los Angeles, um, to really expand that out um, to uh, beyond just downtown, but but really looking at uh, some of our other communities, especially in uh, equity focused communities to make sure that we lift up our riders in the communities that need it most. Very good. And then the only other thing I'll add is, you know, you know, we have this model, but it's very important to ensure that we're looking at each community um, differently and also working very closely to identify concerns from other communities. So just because this worked here in downtown LA doesn't mean that it would work in Long Beach or you know, any, anywhere else around the county here where we're implementing bus lanes. So this is a model, but then we take the model and we tailor it based on the conversations we're having and what we're hearing from the community because they're the experts, uh, the businesses, the residents, the stakeholders, the elected officials are really the ones that are gonna tell us um, you know, what will work. So having that close coordination for each community is very important. Excellent. So, um, and, and that kind of goes into the last question here. We just have a few minutes left. Um, the, the paper, a budding model, is available for, for download on our website and it has a bunch of thoughts and recommendations, not just for LA Metro, of course, but but for all transit agencies that are looking to do this kind of thing. And um, just spend a minute. And we'll again, we'll 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 go around the horn. Um, start with Cassie. Now, what what would you say is the biggest or most important takeaway from this experience? And and if you had one thing to to offer to other agencies that are tuned into this, um, what would you suggest to them? I would say just measure the impact on people, not um, vehicles, because when you look at vehicle speeds, um, we saw about a decrease of, I think about two minutes travel time for, for vehicles, uh, privately owned vehicles, and about a two minute time savings for um, people on the bus. And so, you know, if you think about it on a vehicle level, maybe it's a wash, but if you think about it on a corridor level, just how many people you're able to get through, you know, 800 additional people during that peak hour period each day. Um, and if you think about the amount of hours saved by commuters who, you know, maybe they're commuting two hours a day, they're making three different connections, uh, transfers. Um, it saves around, I think it was like 300 hours, close, more than 300 hours a day um, collectively when you think about those 10,000 riders that are on the bus. Um, and as Stephen and Ida emphasize that these are, um, you know, the lowest income. Um, you know, primarily people of color, uh, and, and they deserve to have priority and to feel that, you know, for on at least two two miles, um, that they are the priority on the street, not, you know, people in cars. So I think that's a really important story to tell um, and something that we were really able to successfully communicate to, you know, our board and to other decision makers when we did this project. That's great. Um, and and thanks for that. I'm I want to be sensitive to the time. Um, there are a bunch of other questions that we didn't get to uh, to get to um, in in part just because we're we're out of time. But that doesn't mean that they'll go unanswered. Um, we'll take a look at those questions after this and follow up with folks. And of course, you can feel free to reach out to me at plewis at enotrans.org. Um, I'm happy to either um, direct you to certain parts of the paper or forward your question on to. Um, Stephen or Cassie or Ida. Um, I again really want to thank the three of you for spending the time with, with us this afternoon, sharing your insights and thoughts. Um, for, for those here on the live webinar, again, thank you for attending. Um, you will be able to find a recording of this webinar on our website. Um, the recording will be emailed to all registrants uh, when it's finished here within a day or so. Um, and make sure to sign up for our mailing list, uh, gain access to um, the free Eno Connector newsletter and other things that, that, that we come out with um, on a regular basis. So again, thanks to the panel. Thanks for this really engaging uh, subject and discussion today. And we look forward to continuing the conversation.